Jesse. Yeah, come get me. Come get me. You want this camera? I know what you want. Yeah, yeah. Camera? Say camera? In 2016, writer-director Damien Chazelle resurrected a dead genre, took us to Hollywood, and gave us a modern musical, La La Land. Mia, an aspiring actor, and Sebastian, an aspiring musician, fall in love and follow their dreams. And it's delightful. Audiences loved it, it was a financial success, and it won several Academy Awards, including Best Picture. Well, almost. This is not a joke. Moonlight has won Best Picture. Moonlight, best picture. Despite the mix-up at the 2017 Oscars, I think La La Land's legacy will be just fine. The film is immediately charming. Show it to anyone and they'll probably like it. But I want to talk about my oddly specific personal relationship with the story. When I was 12, my mom and I moved to Los Angeles, California so that I could be an actor. I was born and raised in Warner Robins, Georgia. Like most hometowns, it's unremarkable, except for an Air Force base which continues to make the city grow. When I lived there, it was notorious for being flat. Smooth roads, one-story buildings, and nothing to do. And I guess that's an ideal place to raise children, but the byproduct was a predictable environment. I tried sports and clubs, but I've always been a homebody, and cinema was a comfortable indoor pastime. I used to love The Mask of Zorro, I would throw on a cape and bounce across our furniture while the movie played in the background. Amazingly, I still have that cape. But being a child, I didn't really know how movies were made. The magic was the final product, and the faces of those products were the actors. So from an early age, I wanted to be an actor. My aunt was an actress. Oh, okay. She was in a traveling theater company. I grew up in Boulder City, Nevada. So across the street from my house, there was this little library and I had an old movie section. And so she, she took me and we spent an entire day watching all these old movies like Notorious and Bringing Up Baby in Casablanca. La La Land follows Mia, an aspiring actor struggling to achieve her dream. And her dream is to be an actor, right? Cappuccino, please. Right, of course. Anas. Oh, no, thank you. I insist. But from the beginning, we get the sense that that's not true. Instead, it seems like she wants the perks of being an actor. Fame, wealth, and privilege. Simply put, to be a star. A technicolor world made out of music and machine. It called me to be on that screen. I started pursuing acting in middle school, and middle school sucks across the board. Everybody's changing, but nobody really understands how. And like a typical adolescent, I felt out of place. I never really fit into a category. I wasn't cool or athletic. I was smart, but I wasn't super smart either. So I committed to acting in middle school because it was a creative escape, a way to feel special. I performed in church musicals and I joined a local theater. Not exactly challenging, but I could sing, wear costumes, and if I was lucky enough, say a line. All in front of an audience, no less. And it did wonders for my ego. I know I was. Of course I was. I still am. And I have something to be optimistic about. And if all the angels will help me out, I'll tell you what I told my people all those years. In December 2006, I participated in a competition in Florida called Talent Rock. It was hosted by Joey Fatone from NSYNC. The event was designed to connect performers with agents and managers. 
Talent Rock's greatest success story was Andrew Caldwell, who's had a steady career of bit parts and guest starring roles. Whoa, this is a hoot. What are we doing, eh? Film producer and talent manager Frederick Levy writes, At the conventions I have attended, aspiring actors attend seminars to learn about the business. They also have an opportunity to perform in competitions and vie for prizes, while at the same time audition for industry professionals such as myself. Oftentimes, the conventions program networking mixers where actors can mingle with industry pros. And the events generally end with a callback session, so that agents and managers can talk one-on-one -on -one with any actor they wish to pursue. I believe in them because I've found some amazing clients through them. If I hadn't been at the now defunct Talent Rock, I never would have discovered Andrew Caldwell. Oh yeah, there she is. Total effing MILF. I could have called Trinity a MILF. Oh well. There are five categories. Acting, modeling, singing, dancing, and comedy. You were allowed to participate in two, so I picked acting and modeling since I wasn't especially skilled in the other categories. Every category was broken up into three age brackets. Kids, ages 5 to 12, teens, ages 13 to 17, and adults, 18 and older. I was 12, so it was easy to ascend the ranks because I was competing with babies who didn't know how to read. For acting, I was given a serial commercial, and I went into a room and recited the commercial in front of judges, who picked a handful of finalists. At the end of the weekend, the finalists performed in front of the entire convention hall. And I was the first person to be called on stage. I did my serial commercial in front of a thousand people. I have no idea if it was any good because my soul left my body. But I got two callbacks, and one agent was enthusiastic enough to convince me to move to the West Coast. So in 2007, I left middle school. I told all of my classmates, I'm going to be a star, and you'll never see me again. And that was that. Without a nickel to my name, hopped a bus, here I came. I could be brave or just insane, we'll have to see. Moving to California to pursue a professional acting career was a bad idea for a lot of reasons, but I'll narrow it down to five. Number one, moving. Moving is complicated on its own, but it wasn't just a fun Hollywood holiday, it divided my family. My stepdad stayed behind because he shared custody of his children. My dad and my stepmom stayed behind because they shared custody of my half-brother. They are living back in Georgia, so we're a bi-coastal family right now, and they're being very supportive of us following this dream. My mom was my biggest champion. She wanted to give me what I wanted. We lived in California for a year and a half, but at the time, my expectation was indefinite. I'm going to make it, and we'll sort the rest out later. I had plenty of voices of reason around me, but I guess the Hollywood dream was more persuasive. I mean, these are real auditions at real movie studios. Who's to say it's not possible? Ironically, Atlanta, Georgia became one of the biggest film capitals in the world. Kill yourself. Number two, timing. I picked a bad time to move because from November 2007 to February 2008, 12,000 writers from the Writers Guild of America went on strike. Mostly television writers over DVD residuals and digital media. The logic would be obvious to a child. A novelist receives fair royalties for their books. A musician receives fair royalties for their songs. Screenwriters deserve fair royalties for their work. Who ever thought walking in a circle at two miles an hour would be draining? Existing shows were on hiatus, and pilots were non-existent. Pilot season is at the beginning of the year, so if a show is picked up and developed, it can premiere in the fall. I had some time before this happened, but most of that was spent trying to find a footing. You don't just show up to Los Angeles and start booking roles. You have to get an agent, or a manager, or both. And it takes time to find people who treat you well and satisfy your needs. Generally, an agent finds auditions for their client, and a manager makes sure their client is trained and prepared. And by the time I was trained and prepared, the well dried up. We're living out here on savings, um, and we've only got enough to make it through next pilot season. And uh, so... Um... Number three. I was 12! And eventually 13. It's the worst possible age you can be as an actor. Puberty is the kiss of death. Everything is inconsistent. My voice changed, my height changed. Gucci! It's an awkward age to categorize. This preteen age bracket only really exists if it's intentional or if younger actors happen to age into it. The film industry would rather cast older actors because it's more reliable. That's why boys are predominantly voiced by women in animation, or why high schools look like fraternity houses. 
I think this distorts our image of teenagers, but from a practical standpoint, I get it. They don't want to deal with schooling or time restrictions or anybody's mom on the sidelines. Although Ryan Gosling became a Mouseketeer at 13, so I'm just making excuses. I think the best thing to do is just be yourself, you know, and just be out there, smile at everybody, and don't try to be too cool, but don't try to be, you know, too uh, <laughs> happy, you know, just try to just be yourself. I think your brain doesn't fully form until you're 25. My fourth problem was my southern accent. You probably can't tell now, but I am from Georgia. There ain't a huge market for southern accents unless a story actually takes place in the south. My accent was never this bad, by the way. I'm channeling my old coworker Bernice. We worked at the Dillard's in North Carolina, and guess what? She was from Warner Robins too. Same high school and everything. Small world. I guess there are some southern spaces in media, but that ain't really what I imagined for myself. An agent once tried to get me an audition for The Bill Ingball Show, and even then I thought, nah. Hey, what do you think? I think I like the one piece with the little seahorses on it you had when you were five. <laughs> it's spring break, Dad. Girls don't go wild in a one piece. <laughs> I'm kidding. Hey, okay, okay, hear me out. Before Jennifer Lawrence became J-Law, she was the daughter on the Bill Engvall sitcom. Okay? <laughs> Good parts come with time, but you gotta hang in there. I know it's so frustrating, but it's the way this industry works. And ultimately, I didn't want to be an actor. I wanted to be a star. La La Land's opening number perfectly captures that naive combination of ambition and vanity. The performers are looking for discovery, but they're gridlocked by overcrowded competition. The whole movie plays with nostalgia and reality, half celebration, half deconstruction, which is why LA culture is such a great vessel for a musical. That's LA. They just, they, they, they worship everything and they value nothing. La La Land is a nickname for Los Angeles, combining the city's initials and the hopeful mindset of people who move there to start their creative careers. It's the City of Stars. City of Stars, are you shining just for me? Personally, I hate LA. I hate the sun, I hate the smog, I hate the traffic, I hate the palm trees. I hate the kitschy parasitic idolatry that mutilates the city into a sycophantic tourist attraction. Not much to look at, huh? But that's just the surface. Because of its reputation, we all have a biased concept of Los Angeles. Shallow, gauche, homogenous. Can you grab my keys? What kind? It's a Prius. I mean, that, that doesn't help me. We did want to have our swings and jabs at the versions of LA that I think we all probably despise, whether we live in LA or not. No. Come on! What? But within the span of a movie, to build a love letter from that. Great musicals are enhanced by great locations. La La Land features iconic landmarks like Griffith Observatory and more prosaic places off the beaten path. And there's not a single shot of the Hollywood sign. That's called restraint. Damien Chazelle and cinematographer Lena Sangren wanted to replicate the aesthetics of older films. La La Land was shot on 35mm Kodak film with Panavision anamorphic lenses. Film stocks pick up rich amounts of color and texture, and anamorphic lenses produce spontaneous light artifacts. So even in the simplest location, like a blank apartment, the camera is capturing film grain, lens flares, and elliptical light and shadow. It makes Los Angeles look sentimental. It'll be fun. And the characters are just as nostalgic. A lot of musicals are about entertainers because it's easier to accept the genre if their singing and dancing is motivated by pre-existing behavior. Mia has three roommates and they're all actors. Their song is called Someone in the Crowd, reinforcing the idea of discovery. You make the right impression, then everybody knows your name. Any chance encounter could make them famous, so they focus on networking. Carlo is a writer. Yeah, so you have a knack for world building. Actors can be vain, self-serving vampires, but we have to advocate for ourselves and our abilities. Actors are selling their face, their voice, their body, and their personality, so they have to take up space. You were in a war, and you give us pizzicaca. 
My mom gave me a book called The Art of Acting, which I never read because MOM, I WANNA PLAY XBOX! The book is a compilation of lectures by Stella Adler, one of the most influential acting teachers of the 20th century. She taught Henry Winkler, Robert De Niro, and Marlon Brando. Hey, Stella! Her books are on Mia's shelf, and Sebastian uses one of her unique phrases, pizzicaca, which has a lot of overlap in other languages, but basically means piss and shit. Pizzicaca. And the very first line of this book is, over the next few months, you will hear me say repeatedly that acting is not about you. But right at the start, I want you to know that you do matter. There's a difference between confidence and arrogance, promotion and ego, and the film makes that distinction with Mia and her roommates. Her roommates are glamorous, promiscuous, and laser focused on discovery. They don't even understand the concept of working. Mia, you're coming, right? I can't. I'm working. What? Did she just say working? Whereas Mia is bookish, dressed down, not like the other girls. Even her party dress is one of her roommates. This looks familiar. I was gonna give How that long have back. you had this? Like, oh, eight come on, Mia. Long time. It's supposed to communicate that Mia has honest reasons for being an actor. But does she, really? Even though Mia is modest, she's just like every other starry-eyed passenger who arrives at LAX. Oh. She has a giant poster of Ingrid Bergman on her wall. She works in a coffee shop on the Warner Brothers lot. That's the window that Humphrey Bogart and Ingrid Bergman looked out of in Casablanca. Wow. Yeah. I can't believe you worked right across the street from that. Yeah. That's amazing. Mia is a tourist in her own city. She idolizes old Hollywood because she thinks she ought to, not because she's well-versed in her industry. She's a poser. It's like Rebel Without a Cause, sort of. I got the bullets! Yes. You've never seen it. I've never seen it. Oh my. So while her disposition is pure, her goals are kind of nebulous. What does she actually want? To be an actor? Okay, what does that mean? Is she training? Is she studying her craft? Is she researching how to get into unions? Does she have an agent or a manager? Is she working with them to update her headshots, her resume, and her online presence? What kind of actor does she want to be? Voice actor, stage actor, commercial actor. Most of her auditions are on camera, so why is that her forte? And most importantly, why does acting fulfill her? What is it about this thing that makes everything else irrelevant? <laughs> Mia is contrasted by Sebastian, who's motivated by passion. More like Sebastian, am I right? The first 15 minutes follows Mia, then switches over to Sebastian before they come together. All Sebastian can think about is jazz. He obsesses over historical landmarks. He worships the old masters, genuinely, in practice. And he knows exactly what he wants. What are you gonna do? I'm gonna have my own club. Really? Yes. We're gonna play whatever we want, whenever we want, however we want, as long as it's pure jazz. But Sebastian has his own brand of dreamer syndrome. If Mia is too generic, then Sebastian is too specific. He has tunnel vision. He's so immersed in traditionalism that he can't see the pragmatic side of art. He bounces from job to job because he can't tolerate anything less than ideal. No submission whatsoever. You're fired. I mean, that's what you're saying, but it's not what you mean. What you mean is... You're fired. Any other requests? I ran. I ran a fantastic suggestion. All right, piano man, tickle those ivories. Let's hit it. Mia and Sebastian run into each other at different times, and that's the basis of their existence. Opportunities keep passing them by. I just heard you play, and I wanted to... Okay, I was an asshole. I can admit that. Okay. But requesting I ran from a serious musician is just, it's too far. My lord, did you just say a serious musician? I don't think so. We know what's going to happen. Love is part of the genre, so the story builds romantic tension. They only meet each other on their third encounter. And this is Emma Stone and Ryan Gosling's third movie together, so it's almost like fate is tapping on their shoulder. It's pretty strange that we keep running into each other. It is strange. Maybe it means something. I doubt it. Yeah, I don't think so. Or people like proximity and commiseration. I'm struggling, you're struggling, let's do it together. 
Mia's been stuck in the audition cycle for six years with no results. She's at the mercy of gatekeepers and who knows what they want. When I first started auditioning, I actually liked that process. I wanted to be behind the scenes. And I got scripts before something was filmed. Or part of a script. They don't give out the whole thing, just the scenes with your character. And that was really exciting. I could read part of Hannah Montana, and a few months later, it was on TV. It lowered the curtain between me and the industry. TV wasn't just a magical box anymore because I had the words in my hands. Yeah, tell her Luke kiss every girl in school. Lily, I feel horrible about this. A little late in the day for that bub. I'm just sorry that your best friend is so threatened by a relationship that she lied to break us up. That's right, straight from the cheetah say what? The word sucked, but I didn't know that. I was 12. But eventually the novelty wore off. This is my classroom. You don't like it, the door's to my left. Lady, why you be tripping like that? No, Jamal. You be tripping. Auditions are really weird because they're so artificial. Most of the time I got the sides on the day, and then I'd go into a room with a stranger and get really excited about Cheerios. Mmm, delicious. Why should you try a Colgate Platinum Whitening Toothpaste? Because nothing gets remembered better than a platinum smile. Go for it with Colgate Platinum and show your smile. My weirdest audition was a voiceover for Madagascar, Escape to Africa. The auditioner sat behind me and I read for the baby versions of Marty, played by Chris Rock, and Melman, played by David Schwimmer. I knew what the adult counterpart sounded like since I had seen the first film, but I wasn't sure where my young, adolescent voice fit into the scheme of things. So I basically did my best higher-pitched impression of Chris Rock and David Schwimmer. And about halfway through, I could hear the auditioner giggling behind me. I suspected that it wasn't going well, but there was also the possibility that I was killing it. Like, this kid is really funny. The same thing happens every time where I get interrupted because someone wants to get a sandwich or I'm crying and they start laughing. I didn't get the part or any part. I don't think I was a bad actor, but I wasn't special. I didn't take the work that seriously. The difference is Mia is actually a good actor. I am, I'm happy for you, I just... I just thought... But maybe good actors are just as routine as everyone else. I don't know what I thought. One second. I guess I thought it was... What are you? Just got on the phone. Um, tell her I'll call her back. I almost got a basketball commercial. Or, that's what my agent said. Right before the audition, my mom and I went to a store and bought a Lakers jersey. And the audition was a lot of fun. I sat on a couch with two other kids and we pretended there was a TV in front of us and we reacted to different cues. Then the auditioner asked us if we liked basketball, what our favorite team was, and I was like, oh, of course, I love the Lakers. Look at the jersey I just bought. Are you kidding me? I didn't like basketball. I picked the Lakers because I lived in LA. Can I borrow what you're wearing? Why? Because I have an audition next week. I'm playing a serious firefighter. I love that Mia wears costumes to auditions because it's endearing and desperate. She can't figure out how to cut through the crowd. She's always looking for that extra angle. Mia is surrounded by redheads, women who look just like her, but taller, skinnier, bustier, all of the superficial qualities that would make her insecure. Actors are like orphans waiting to be chosen, so it's easy to perceive lookalikes as more attractive, more talented. And I assume it's worse for parts that are specified by race or age or weight, anything neglected by the Hollywood machine. You are first and foremost a physical type. I was extremely jealous of my contemporary, Logan, who auditioned for and eventually got a part in Step Brothers. Does Butt Buddy have a name? If you're referring to me as Butt Buddy, yes, I do have a name. It's Brennan Huff. And this whole business is all about who you know. So since Logan worked with Will Ferrell, he also got to be in Land of the Lost. We were the same age, we had the same look, we were both from Georgia, we took classes together, and we had the same manager. So why didn't I get to audition for that part? I wasn't Lawrence Oliver, but I could say lines in front of a camera. For every role in media history, I assume there's another actor out there who's bitter that they didn't get that part, fixating on this petty grudge for the rest of their life. Am I still jealous of a teenager from 15 years ago? <laughs> Please. 
And maybe I was less experienced, or maybe I wasn't right for the role, but it's hard not to take that personally. I shared so many superficial traits with someone, but he got more opportunities, so there had to be something wrong with me specifically. Actors. They're so sensitive. Or there's people sitting in the waiting room, and they're, and they're like me, but prettier mm. and better at the... Because maybe I'm not good enough. Yes, you are. No. No, maybe I'm not. Yes, you are. Maybe I'm not. You are. Maybe I'm not. You are. Mia needs validation. She's begging for people to give her a chance, but they won't. So instead, Mia leans on Sebastian. He's in the same boat. He knows what it's like. And he's positive about her ambitions, which is really attractive. So you could just write your own roles, you know? Write something that's as interesting as you are, and you don't have to audition for this yeah. uh, pishy caca. Sebastian is the ultimate gentleman. He opens the door for her, he wipes off germs, he wears polyester suits. It's wool. You're right, I'd never fall for you at all. And he looks like Ryan Gosling, so I call that a no-brainer. Even though Mia has a boyfriend. But just because there's a goalie doesn't mean you can't score! Mr. Steel Girl is bad. It's a minor plot point, but her boyfriend adds to the romantic tension. Mia accidentally agrees to see a movie with Sebastian on the same night as a double date with her boyfriend. So she has a choice. The perfect man at a vintage theater, or a group of snobs complaining about theaters. I mean, you know theaters these days. Yeah. They're so dirty. Yeah, I know. Smelly. And they're either too hot or too cold. I know, the quality's really falling off. All these terrible, <laughs> and there's always you know, people talking. Oh, because of the, all the, just, the uh, Oh, it's the worst. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, hold people on one texting. second. One second. And, well, the choice is clear. It's simple, in a good way. Most of their chemistry is nonverbal. Dancing personifies inner desires. Partners have to work together, move in sync with each other, so regardless of their friendship, choreography brings them closer. It's an expression that's deeply intimate and chaste. They dance twice before they kiss. Dancing is a precursor to kissing, even if it takes time to get there. Who needs words to say, I love you? You can play Bishop and I'll move as your pawn. And I won't knock down as your sword is drawn. You wear the With a perfect yeah, to the untrained eye How can kiss the door adore me little though I am although my fingers and my hands aren't fit to handle such a man. So what is a dream? I guess it's something you want, regardless of what it takes to get it. Stella Adler says to dream is to imagine something you don't have yet, but would like to have. It is to see something before you. At the end of the film, five years later, Mia's dream comes true. She's famous, wealthy, and privileged. She's a star. I could have two iced coffees, please. Right, of course. On us. Oh, no, thank you, I insist. But if being a star was her dream, did acting even matter? The second half of La La Land starts to rub against my own experiences, which isn't a bad thing, it's just my relationship with the story. And the second half is more realistic, less musical, so it's harder to justify some of the messier plot points. But I know what you're thinking, Jesse, why are you picking on La La Land, the cutest movie ever made? That's like stealing candy from a baby. And yeah, that's fair. 
I think most people will experience this film as it was intended. It's a throwback to a softer filmmaking era. The songs are catchy, the relationship is joyous and bright. And when things take a turn for the worse, it punches you in the gut. And that's what I love too. I love this movie, so whatever I say critically doesn't take away from that. But I have a hard time accepting the hazy, follow your dreams mantra that's reinforced by the narrative. And it's not just one isolated criticism, it's layered over every other aspect. It's in the lyrics. Our dreams, they finally come true. It defines their relationship. You gotta give it everything you got. Everything. It's your dream. And it's the foundation of all of the drama. Well, it matters, because if you're gonna give up your dream, I think it matters that you like what you're playing on the road for years. I want to be clear that people should pursue art, 100%. Encouragement is great, finding a platform takes time and chances, and people do make a living off of their creative skills. We can pay you a thousand bucks a week, plus a cut of the ticket revenue and merchandising. Sound good? <clears throat> Everything changes when Keith, an old friend, invites Sebastian to be in his jazz band. Sebastian declines at first, but eventually he's persuaded by financial pressure. He can't play to empty seats if he wants to be successful. But the sound isn't really his style. So what's the difference between a job and selling out? How much money should you sacrifice for your comfort zone? Sebastian worships the past to a fault. He doesn't understand why culture has passed him by, and that limits his potential. How are you going to be a revolutionary if you're such a traditionalist? You're holding on to the past, but jazz is about the future. Work is corrosive. It eats time. It drains mental health and relationships. And if it's supplemental to another career, it's hard to know what your priority should be. But La La Land isn't that concerned with money. Like everything else, poverty gets the Hollywood treatment. It's there, but it's background noise, or it's romantic. Why do you say romantic like it's a dirty word? Unpaid bills are not romantic. The story uses poverty as an obstacle because that's what movies about success are supposed to have, but it doesn't really confront how poverty can restrict creative people for years. Oh. It's an empty threat. For example, Mia goes off the deep end. She quits her barista job and moves in with Sebastian while he's on tour, adding friction to their relationship. Most people don't have that luxury. They have to put up with their boss. They have to put up with rude customers. Ugh, I'd like a refund. There's a nice way to say that, Karen. Whenever there's a financial obligation, everyone just ignores it. When Mia has to work but her roommates want her to come to a party... YOLO! <laughs> When Sebastian bounces from job to job, it's so quirky. All you have to do is keep your head down and your eyes on the prize. And even when the answer's no, or when my money is running low, the dusty mic and neon glow are all I need. But poverty is not cute. It's not fun, and it's not something you can ignore for the purity of art. Even though Keith's band is corporate and exhausting, Sebastian is getting paid to play music. The opportunity fell in his lap. He gets to consider whether it's a right fit for him. He gets to leverage his platform for a better career. And that's a rare privilege. Choice is a privilege. If a water stain is your worst problem, count your blessings. Now that Mia is voluntarily unemployed, she decides to write and perform her own one-woman show. Wow, check out Phoebe Waller-Bridge. <laughs> Her show is a bizarre plot point because a lot of the details are glossed over. The planning happens during a montage. Her expectations and the contents of the play are absent. And this section is mostly devoted to Sebastian's band, so we don't know if Mia is still pursuing acting in the traditional film industry. What we do know is that Mia paid to use the theater. Her show is called So Long Boulder City, so it's about her. Surprise, surprise. It's for one night only, and she hopes people will show up. To what end? I don't know. Does she want to make money? Well, I'm guessing independently financed one-woman shows aren't exactly blockbusters. Nobody so, showed up. So what? I can't pay back the theater. I can't pay back the theater. <laughs> what? 
Does she want to be discovered? Mia invites a list of casting directors by spamming their email addresses, which is desperate on every level. Her subject line is Mia Dolan, performance of one woman show. I'm not a casting director, but I would block her so fast. She ends her email with, this play is truly a labor of love for me, and I cannot wait to show you what I'm capable of. <laughs> but so far, all of this is consistent with her character. She's oblivious, she's desperate, and I've been there. At Talent Rock, every agent had a booth in a convention hall and a box to collect headshots and resumes. I only got two callbacks, but I went to every single booth and dropped my headshot into their box, even though they had no intention of working with me. So delusional thinking isn't bad writing. The problem is that her delusional thinking is treated sympathetically by the film in three significant ways. One, Mia is expecting Sebastian to be at her show, but he can't make it because he's doing a photo shoot. I want to point out that this is the second time that a character misses an important date because of another booked engagement. Did you forget? You forgot. That's tonight. I thought that was next Thursday. No, it's tonight. That's either clever or la la lazy, and I'm not really sure which. Sebastian's absence is apparently unforgivable, and Mia breaks up with him. Kind of. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. sorry. I'm sorry. sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm gonna make it up to you. It's not really about him, but I still think it's unfair. Two, her show's failure is the straw that breaks the camel's back. Mia decides to give up and go home, and we're supposed to feel bad for her even though she put all of her eggs in one delusional basket. And finally, actually, her show wasn't a failure. Amy Brandt, the casting director. Yeah. She was at your play, and she loved it. And she loved it so much that she wants you to come in tomorrow and audition for this huge movie that she's got. Mia's play sets off a chain reaction that eventually propels her to stardom. And for me, that's such a lie. Some people are plucked out of obscurity and they get famous overnight. But that's pretty rare, and usually it's detrimental to anyone who doesn't know who they are before getting that much attention. Someone like Mia, for example. Somewhere there's a place where I find who I'm gonna be. This could all be part of the same deconstruction that's been layered throughout the film, but as far as I can tell, she looks well adjusted. She has fame, money, a husband, a child, and the world's attention hasn't affected her at all. So the film is suggesting that Mia doesn't have to learn any hard truths. She was right the whole time, and all of those meanie heads just couldn't see it. Was it not enough for Mia to be a working actor? Did she have to be a prima donna whose coffee is ready for her, free of charge? I sympathize with Damien Chazelle because he obviously understands the film industry's shortcomings. But he's also making a movie. If it's too critical, it undermines the musical. If it's too nostalgic, it doesn't feel authentic. It feels really nostalgic to me. Is That's it too nostalgic? Yeah, That's are people gonna like it? Fuck them. <laughs> With La La Land, I wanted to explore how you balance life and art, how you balance dreams and reality. As an artist myself, as someone who moved to LA young and was trying to make it, had big dreams, there's a real balancing act between those dreams and reality. I think one change could have made all of this more nuanced. Instead of devoting all of her spare time to a random, one-night-only, one-woman show, Mia should also act in smaller industry roles that she finds unfulfilling. Commercials, student films, maybe even extra work. By doing this, Mia looks more sympathetic for paying her dues. One might reference a classic musical for inspiration. I do hope you're gonna favor us with something special tonight. Me. Say, uh, Hamlet's soliloquy uh, or the balcony scene from Romeo and Juliet. Oh, don't be shy. You make about the prettiest Juliet I've ever seen. It would also take the pressure off of her show. Again, the fundamental problem is that Mia makes a weird artistic decision, but the film needs you to sympathize with her. If you don't, a lot of the drama feels forced. If she acted in so-called demeaning projects and wrote her own project on the side, we'd understand that this one experience isn't the be-all end-all, but rather a collective effect. She's not giving up because of one bad night, it's the entire process, which is what they were going for. And she'd be in the same position as Sebastian. They'd both be distracted by labor. 
When two people drift apart, I want to feel like both sides have a point, that everything has to end this way. Two ships passing in the night. The idea is that Mia and Sebastian can't be together because their dreams conflict, which is represented by a fight scene. It's well acted and well written, except Mia doesn't have a strong position, so I don't know if it's enough to support the weight of their eventual breakup. Going on tour is putting stress on their relationship, so Sebastian invites her to come with him, even though her play is in two weeks. Why can't you? Come to Boise? Yeah. Because I have to rehearse. Yeah, but can't you rehearse anywhere? And he's right. She doesn't have any commitments except for her performance. But let's give her some wiggle room and say she needs to rehearse in Los Angeles. Well, all my stuff is here and it's in two weeks, so I don't really think that would be... Okay. The best idea well, right now, but I wish I could. After that, her schedule is wide open. Unless, of course, she gets hired by all of those casting directors who are definitely going to be there. Dramatically, Sebastian is supposed to be dismissing her. My career is better than yours. But that doesn't work if he's right. His career makes money. His career is popular. And whether it's better, well, from an audience's perspective, we get to see what he does and we don't get to see what she does. Sebastian's band gets an entire song and it's awesome. Don't you know? Mia's performance happens off screen. If Mia had smaller industry jobs, she'd have a reason to stay behind, making his invitation more condescending. He would actually be dismissing her. And it would make their real argument more compelling. Of course I wanted you to have a steady job so that you could take care of yourself and your life and you could start your club. Yeah, so I'm doing that, so I don't understand. Like, why aren't we celebrating? Why aren't you starting your club? Sebastian is trading his happiness for complacency and financial security. If both of them had token jobs at the expense of their passions, they'd both have a point about each other's hypocrisy. But Mia doesn't have a job. She quit her job. I have a steady job, this is what I'm doing, and now all of a sudden if you had these problems, I wish you would have said them earlier before I signed on the goddamn dotted line. I'm pointing out that you had a dream, that you followed, that you were sticking to. This is to. the dream. This is the dream. This is not your Guys dream. Guys like me work their whole lives to be in something that's successful, that people like. So instead of a balanced argument that understandably drives them apart, Mia comes across as critical, jealous, naive, ungrateful, unproductive, and unsympathetic, all because of her decision to write and perform her own one-woman show. Which again, doesn't have to be bad. You could go in a different direction, address Mia's flaws, and call her motivations into question. Does she really want to act, or does she want notoriety? Why do you care so much about being liked? You're an actress! What are you talking about? <sighs> the more I study film, the less I care about celebrities. There are so many incredible supporting actors out there. The actors I met in California weren't celebrities, I was just proud to see them on TV occasionally. What are you? Oh my god. <laughs> it's okay. It's good. Most actors are underrated because they're a piece of the puzzle, not the other way around. And I hope celebrities feel the same way. Being part of a project or playing a character that people feel something for is such a wonderful thing that it doesn't really feel like it's about me at the end of the day. Unfortunately, La La Land doesn't share this philosophy. The takeaway is not what can I do for a project, but what can a project do for me? They don't call her Mia for nothing. The ending damages the rest of the film, so any possibility of a cautionary tale gets eclipsed by the love letter. When the people in traffic sing about reaching for the heights, it's no longer deconstructing vanity, it's celebrating attention. When Mia and her roommates sing about someone in the crowd, it's no longer critiquing desperation, it's a rallying cry for discovery. All of which is capped off by Mia's audition scene. Glad we found you. To really cement the film's stance on narcissism, Mia auditions for a part that doesn't have a script. Instead, the character is going to be built around the actor. I mean, how symbolic can you get? The movie takes place in Paris, so Mia auditions by telling a story about her aunt that transitions into the song, Audition, The Fools Who Dream. My aunt used to live in Paris. I remember she used to come home and tell us these stories about being abroad. And I remember she told us that she jumped into the river once, barefoot. She smiled, leapt without looking, and tumbled into the Seine. The water was freezing, she spent a month sneezing, but said she would do it again. Here's to the ones who dream, foolish as they may seem. Here's to the hearts that ache, 
here's to the mess we make. She captured a feeling, sky with no ceiling, the sunset inside a frame. She lived in her liquor and died with a flicker. I'll always remember the flame. Here's to the ones who dream, foolish as they may seem. Here's to the hearts that ache, here's to the mess we make. She told me a bit of madness is key to give us new colors to see. Who knows where it will lead us, and that's why they need us. So bring on the rebels, the ripples from pebbles, the painters and poets and plays. And here's to the fools who dream, crazy as they may seem. Here's to the hearts that break, here's to the mess we make. I trace it all back to then, her and the snow and the sen. Smiling through it, she said she'd do it again. Giving up was healthy. I was only out there for a year and a half, but all of that time and effort put things in perspective. I didn't want to do it anymore. For me, acting was a hobby motivated by attention and escapism. So the work it took to be a professional actor started to look like, well, work. And I was just a kid. It's over. What? All of this. I'm done embarrassing myself. I'm done. I'm done. Even though Mia's play is absurd, when she goes home, oof, it hurts. Throughout the film, there are shots of Mia driving, left to right. Most languages have left to right scripts, in this case English, which means filmmakers have internalized left to right as this way forward. When Mia goes home, she's facing right to left. Now she's going backwards. That's pretty cool. There's something tragic about taking a risk and losing anyway. Inspirational resources will tell you that trying is the hardest part, and the implication is that it's worth it. But I don't know if that's true. The world can chew you up and spit you out. I'm gonna go home for a while. I'm gonna, I'll come see you tomorrow. No, I'm going home home. This is home. No, it's not anymore. And going home is safe. It's a familiar place with no expectations. You don't have to perform, just be. Maybe I'm one of those people that has always wanted to do it, but it's like a pipe dream for me, you know? And then you you set it, you, you change your dreams and then you grow up. Mia conveniently lives in Nevada so that Sebastian can drive out there and save her. Trust me, nobody drove out to Georgia to save me. I basically lived a normal life afterwards. It was like it never happened. My classmates were interested in my story for about five minutes, but what was I supposed to say? I auditioned for iCarly? But I didn't really accomplish anything, so nobody cared. Everyone eventually learns that they're insignificant. Or at least they're not owed anything just because. But that's tough to learn so young all at once. I think the danger of success stories is that they're told by people who succeeded. It's survivor's bias. We've all heard stories about actors who dropped out of high school or took a risk for their big break. I moved here knowing absolutely nobody. Wow. I had one person that I knew. I had no money. I had no green card. I just had a dream. Oh, yeah. There she is. Total effing MILF. But failures don't have a platform to share their experiences. Usually. If you're watching this video, I guess I got what I wanted after all. But now the work comes first. If you do anything because you're trying to impress your parents or your ex or the kids in middle school, it's not worth it. I would hate for impressionable people to view media like this and feel like they can get what they want just because they want it badly enough. They say we gotta want it more. In the world of La La Land, people are divided into two categories. Good guys who support Mia's dream and bad guys who get in the way. Good guys say yes. You said it yourself. You're a, you're a child prodigy playwright. That is not what I said. Well, you're too modest to say it, but it's true. Bad guys say no. You're closing Friday. I, I, I can't close on Friday. I have an audition. Do Remember? I look like I care? We schedule it. Good guys say yes. Genius. <laughs> really? Yes. Really? Yes. Bad guys say no. Two options. You either follow my rules or follow my rules. Capiche? Thank you. It's, oh. Thanks. I can do it a different way. No, that's, that's fine. Thank you very much. Good guys say yes. I'm terrified. They should be so lucky to see it. Bad guys say no. Maybe you just liked me when I was on my ass because it made you feel better about yourself.
Are you kidding? No. And that's what ego is. It's how I see myself, yes, but it's also how other people fit into my world. That's why it's hard for me to tune out my isolated criticisms and focus on the good stuff like the relationship, because their relationship is based on Mia absorbing Sebastian's benevolence without consequences. When he stops, they break up. After the audition, they're able to reconcile, but they understand that their careers are going to conflict. She has to move to Paris, and he has to start his jazz club. I'm always going to love you. I'm always going to love you, too. Five years later, Mia is a star. She goes out with her husband, and they end up in a jazz club, and guess who the owner is? I just heard you play, and I want to... The epilogue features a dream ballet, which is a dance production that summarizes everything, emotionally, symbolically. It's a fantasy, a snapshot of what could have been if Mia and Sebastian stayed together. It's ambiguous whose fantasy this is, but I think it's Mia's. Everything about her life is the same, except she's married to Sebastian. He supports her, he moves to Paris with her, and he replaces her husband shot for shot. And that's usually how I imagine things when I think about my exes. It's my life, but the people from my past are with me now, regardless of their circumstances. They're just props in my one-person show. That's ego. So humility is accepting reality. Please pursue what you want. I'm just asking you to question why you want it. Because if your motivations can't survive interrogation, then they won't survive hardship, and they won't survive success either. Stella Adler says, I know you must make a living, and I know you must be a success. I know that in our society, we can't pretend that success doesn't matter. But beyond that, you must understand that soon you'll have in front of you a picture of your whole self, a diagnostic photograph. And this photograph will say, this is what I am capable of, and this is what I must work on. The success and the money will then be in proportion to what you can become. You must consider at each juncture, am I willing to trade this much work in progress for this much success and money? And at times, the money and success will be zero. Today, the influences of your society pressure you to be successful before your time. They are pulling you down. They have pulled you down, you big, sweet, magnificent, young, potential artists. They have pulled you down so far that you are on the verge of destruction. Only you don't know it because you want to be a success. I want you to be able to say, they can give me the part or they can take away the part. I know I'm an actress. I know how to live with my work whether or not they give me the part. I know without them giving me the chance. La La Land is a warm, comfortable movie, but it's a movie. It's not a model for life or love. Trust me, I've had broken dreams. I was seduced by the stage, the applause, and the solitary spotlight. But the City of Stars isn't shining just for me. Say Baba. Can you say Baba? Yeah. Yeah, Baba. 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 <laughs> I love you.